Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship here at Salem Lutheran Church. My name is Paul Wildey. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to lead you in worship this morning. Special welcome to any guests here with us this morning, as well as all of Salem's members who are here to worship God in his house. We also welcome those of you who are watching as we live stream this service this morning. We're glad you're able to join us from wherever you're joining us from. If you're here in the worship building this morning, please do remember to sign the worship registers, those little books in the pews that helps us track our attendance and and, uh, helps us a great deal as we do our ministry here in Owasso. So thanks as always for doing that. Um, We're we're continuing our our season of the Sundays after Pentecost, the season of the church year where we look at God's word and and look at uh, how it directly applies to our lives, what it teaches us about the Christian life. And uh, today as we look at God's word, we're going to see the Christian life is a very focused one. Uh, kind of like a, a golfer is focused on, I'm told, I'm not enough of a golfer to know this by myself, but I'm told uh, when you take your golf swing, you never keep your eye off the ball. Is that right, golfers? Keep your eye, thank you, yes. Uh, keep your eye on the ball. Uh, you have to focus on that ball because otherwise bad things happen, like when I golf, because my swing looks something like this. I get distracted by the birds or the other golfers or the drinks cart or whatever else might be going by. I get distracted or, and, and the ball goes wherever it's going to go, and I usually just let the range ball go and go play from wherever my better golfing friend's ball went, and that works better for everyone. Uh, Christian life is kind of the same way. If we don't keep our eyes focused, if we don't keep our hearts focused on the right thing, our life can go off into all sorts of different places we don't want to go, and and places that are certainly more damaging and worrisome and and upsetting and dangerous than just a a water hazard or a sand trap. So as we look at God's Word today, we're going to see that the Christian life is a life that is focused entirely on, on service. God bless us as we do that today. We'll begin our worship by singing the opening hymn, hymn 919, Blessed Jesus at Your Word.
Please stand. For worship this morning, we follow the service setting two. You can find that on page 172 in the hymnal. It's also projected on the screens. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and bring forth fruits in faith, hope, and love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading for this Sunday comes from Genesis chapter 18. Throughout Scripture, we see this this repeated theme of, of God expecting service from his people, but also being maybe even more interested in serving his people. Here he appears to Abraham and Sarah, to whom he's made promises, promise after promise for years and years that he's going to give them a son, that they're going to become a great nation through that son, and yet they continue to get older and older. Now as he gets closer to fulfilling that promise to them, he appears to them not just to get a nice meal from them and let them serve him, but to serve them and strengthen their faith in the promise he's about to fulfill. We read Genesis chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me give you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. The word of the Lord. We continue our worship with the psalm of the day, Psalm 119b. You'll notice that this one is printed a little bit differently maybe than we're used to since Psalm 119 is the longest of all the psalms and broken down into different sections. Um, the, the hymnal also does that, so we'll sing the refrain and then we'll sing the verses that are under Psalm 119b and then we'll sing the refrain, the rest of the verses, the Gloria and the refrain. It's also on the screens if you get lost. Uh, so we sing the, the, hymn, or the psalm of the day, Psalm 119b.
The second reading for this morning comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1. And in the opening to his and Timothy's letter to the believers in Colossae, Paul kind of gets, he gets really excited and worked up to the point where he gives us this really long run-on sentence where he's so excited about all the work and service that they're providing to God and to one another. And he sees that as coming from one thing and one thing only, their, their faith and their growth in the gospel from which all their service flows. We read Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance, endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday comes from St. Luke's Gospel account, chapter 10. These verses serve as the basis for our sermon as well as the, the theme for our worship. We read Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We'll continue by singing the hymn of the day, hymn 645, one thing's needful.
My dear friends in Christ, this year I finally started working on a passion project of mine that's been years overdue. I, I started restoring my family's generationally owned pop-up camper. My, my grandpa Wildy, when he was a pastor in Michigan, bought this when my dad and his siblings were little, and they went on lots of adventures until they were grown. Then my uncle Mark had it and took his family, then my dad had it and took us, and now it's finally come down to me. And as you might expect, a camper that was built in 1968 needs a little bit of work if it's going to be livable in 2022. In fact, that's kind of my goal. My, my goal in my mind has been livable by Labor Day as I started working on this. And, and at the beginning of summer when I thought I had all this time, I thought this will be an easy goal. Now I'm starting to think it's maybe more lofty than it originally was. I think it's still doable, livable by Labor Day. So a week ago, Saturday, I found some time. I actually had a good amount of time on a Saturday morning to work, and I, I didn't sleep in too late, and the weather was nice, so it wasn't too hot out in the barn. I had a plan. Um, even though I hadn't worked for a long time on it, I knew what I was going to be doing, so I was, everything was lined up for a good day of work. I, I headed out to my barn with, uh, with all sorts of excitement to get ready to pull off some of the aluminum siding and, and, and the aluminum trim so I could see the plywood underneath, see how much I need to restore, replace, whatever, rebuild. It was kind of exciting. I was all ready for a good day of good work. Uh, but I couldn't do a thing because of this nasty little thing called a clutch head screw. Does anyone know what that is? Uh, it's, it's a security screw, and it's a, it's a very niche security screw. So the idea is that uh, these security screws can screw in, but it's very difficult to screw them out. They don't want people to be able to disassemble it. You maybe see some in like bathroom stalls sometimes, places you don't want to disassemble. And a clutch head screw specifically was very popular in the late 60s, in the RV industry. So raise your hand if you have a clutch head screwdriver lying around the house. I do now, but that Saturday I had no idea where it was. So even though I had a barn full of all sorts of other good tools, even though I had all the, all the equipment, all the, all the supplies I needed to get some good work done, even though I had all the excitement and momentum and motivation to get something done, I couldn't do a thing because I could not take these silly bow tie looking screws out. Last, sa uh, last Saturday, Saturday clutch head screwdriver was my one thing needful in life, at least in my life as an amateur camper restoreman. Uh, and, and today, as we, as we contemplate the, the one thing needful in a Christian's life and what God teaches us about the Christian life, we'll see the one thing needful in our faith lives, the one thing that we can't do without at all, the one thing that without which our life becomes pointless and empty and, and we find ourselves frustrated and anxious and upset and unable to accomplish anything like I was that morning in the barn. The thing that has to be the single focus in our entire lives is service. The Christian life is a life that is focused on service. And now as, as well-trained and well-catechized Lutherans, I'm sure maybe some of you are smelling a bit of a rat when I say that, but most of the rest of the world would agree and say, yes, amen, pastor, a Christian's life is a life of Christian service. Service to God, after all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Is part of God's shortest summary of his law. And, and, and service to our fellow humans. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Uh, even, even atheists and agnostics and members of other religions around the world will say, yes, amen, Christians, please do this. Please be good people. Please live your lives of Christian service. Live up to the lofty ideals and goals that, that Jesus lays out for you in Scripture. And to our credit, we try. Right? Congregations like ours and, and denominations and church bodies around the world spend millions and billions of dollars every single year and minutes and hours and days and months and years in service to God and others. Projects like digging wells and building orphanages around the world, supporting uprooted and hurting fellow believers in, in war-torn countries, providing medical help and, and, uh, and education around the world. Even things like distributing pill bottles like we collect here at Salem and, and running a food pantry and more. And what a beautiful thing that is. That brings great joy when that happens. That, that glorifies God as people reach out in love to others. This is not a bad thing in the slightest. And, and this is the kind of stuff that got Paul and, and Timothy so excited when they heard about what was going on at Colossae that they, <laughs> they kind of made a run-on sentence that's hard to read. And, and we're just so excited about all the things God was doing through those people. But as important and God-pleasing and God-praising and God-glorifying and beneficial to the world as this service to God and others is, this is not the service that is the highest 
focus in a Christian's life. Or at least it shouldn't be. It can't be. We can't afford it. In fact, kind of surprisingly or unsuspectingly, the devil himself would love nothing more than our service to God and our service to others be the most important thing in our lives because the results are disastrous. In today's gospel, we find uh, the familiar story. We find Jesus in the house of Martha and Mary, the sisters of a man we know named Lazarus. This is a family that scripture tells us was very near and dear to Jesus' hearts. They're his dear friends. He loves them. And you know the story well. Jesus is there teaching, and, and Mary, Luke tells us, was sitting at his feet, listening to every word he had, listening to him. And her sister Martha is doing good stuff too. She's, she's busy being the perfect host. And, and she actually gets a little bit frustrated with Mary. Her sister should help, she thinks. We can relate, right? All this hard work she has to do uh, to show Jesus how much she loves and supports him. There's all of this to do, and, and she's left doing it alone. So she, she asks Jesus, can you, can you help me out a little bit, Jesus? Remind Mary of what she should be doing, how she should be serving. And she takes it for granted that Jesus is going to agree. Of course he's going to agree. Service is the focus. It's most important. These are important things. God wants us to serve others. And, and right now, Mary and I have this opportunity, unique opportunity, not just to serve God and others, but to serve the God-man, Jesus himself, in the flesh, in our home. Jesus, a little help here, she says. Aren't you, aren't you worried about Mary not doing what she should be doing? Tell her to help refocus her. Get her focused on service that matters. Martha was really giving in to some pretty natural and relatable urges, wasn't she? We've maybe been there. Our, our, our hearts and minds, they just naturally want to go to the things we can do, the things we can control, focus on those kinds of things, what we can do, how we can follow the rules, how we can do and believe and say the right things in the right th and at the right time. And this can come from a godly place. It can come from our desire to glorify God and, and serve him the way he wants and serve others the way God wants us to. But it certainly could come from a place of, of denial and self-justification or guilt and obligation. But either way, even if it's coming from a good place, if that's all we have, if that's the main focus, our service to God, what we can do for him, our service to our fellow humans, what we can do for, for our friends and our families and the rest of the world, if that's all we have, our main purpose, it gets us to exactly the same place that Martha found herself in our story. Frustration, worry, anxiety, maybe worrying about others a little more than we should. Because the devil loves nothing more than to take a good thing, right? To take a good thing, like even service to God and service to one another and and use it to distract us or rob us of our hope. Martha was not very peaceful. She did not feel very hopeful. In fact, it's interesting that distract is the word that Luke uses to choose to describe what Martha was. It says Mary was, was sitting, listening at Jesus' feet. Martha was being distracted. And not even by anything bad, right? But by good, God-pleasing good things providing for, serving, loving her friend and Savior Jesus. How often do you think we might find ourselves distracted by, by even good things? Distracted by all the things we want to do for God and do for our, our fellow humans and our friends and our families to show our love for God and for them. What a shame that is when we allow even these good things to distract us because it gets us nowhere but where Martha was, frustrated and worried and upset about many things. These are the things that can be taken. If I make my whole, my whole, uh, my, my peace and comfort, if I take that from being a pastor, my service as a pastor can end just like that. One slip in temptation and I'm done. One accident with my voice and I can't preach anymore. And whatever kind of ways you serve your families and you serve others, those can be taken away too, can't they? Just like that. I mean, how many of our, our members at, here at Salem are are facing the facts that the way they served God and others when they were younger are no longer really options for them as they face the reality of living a long life in a world that's full of sin. Gets you nowhere, but frustrated, upset, worried about many things, focused on service, but the wrong service. And we're all guilty of being distracted like Martha and if we're honest with ourselves, it's not just being distracted by the good things we should be doing, but we get distracted by a lot of stuff we shouldn't be doing too. But just like we get distracted like Martha, we also have 
a gracious and loving Savior like Martha. And grace and love and peace just emanate from how Jesus handles this situation with Martha. Because while well, Martha doesn't exactly get the answer she expects, she, he, he doesn't scold Mary like, like she thinks Mary deserves. She, he doesn't re-remind Mary that she should be helping her sister. While Martha doesn't get the answer she expects, she doesn't really get the answer we might expect either for being someone in the wrong. Or maybe the answer we'd expect to receive ourselves from our Savior when we're distracted by all the good things or bad things of this life. We'd expect a scolding. And, and Martha expected a scolding but it, for Mary. But even though she was wrong, a scolding is not what she got from her Savior. Instead, instead of even lovingly and gently scolding her, he, he ever so gently and ever so lovingly just says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so much. You're upset about so much, but few things are needed. In fact, really only the one. And Mary has the right idea. She's focused on service that matters. My service to you. My love for you. It's a little ironic almost that, that Martha is so caught up in serving her Savior that she fails to see his invitation to be served by him. She's so caught up in, in hosting him so perfectly that she fails to see what, what Mary saw. The thing that can't be taken away, his, savior, or his service, his hosting, his providing for her. Because ultimately this is the service, not our service to God and others, but God's service to us is what has to be the focus of every single second, of every minute, of every day, of every week, month, and year of our lives. It has to be the focus, Christ's service for us. Without it, all of our service to God gets us exactly nowhere but despair and misery and defeat and emptiness. The, the service of Christ for us is incredibly important but because we can't even begin to serve him and others without him first serving us. We can't begin, we can't put our service over his. And isn't that kind of crazy and backwards, right? This is God's grace, his undeserved love for us in, in, in plain as day. A God who, who demands perfection from us, but when we don't live up to it, doesn't say, well, try harder, be more perfect, figure it out. He's not content either just to condemn us. Instead, he comes and serves us. Almighty God choosing to be our servant. The fact that before he even asks anything of us, he offers and invites, come, be served by me, because it's what you need. Christ's service to us, to the world, is the focus of the Christian life. It's the one thing needful. It's the one thing we need. We need it desperately as sinful people who fail to do the things God asks us to do every single day. We need Jesus' service to us because we give in so often to our temptation to prove or earn our righteousness by our own acts of service. We need Christ's saving service for us on the cross because of, well, because of all the times we've failed to focus on his service for us on the cross because of our weakness of faith. We need it because Christ's service to us is what wins us forgiveness and eternity and comfort in this life and the assurance that the next is eternal. But a, but a focus on Christ's service is not just something for for death. It's not just something you learn in catechism class or in Sunday school or, or whenever you find out about what God has done for you and you say, okay, excellent. I know that. Now I'm good. Um, that'll, that'll be good for me on the last day. Now I just got to muddle through the rest of life. And it's not, just a, it's not just a dry theological point for us to like know and be like, all right, I've got that knowledge. I've got that doctrine down. Excellent. I know more stuff. It's not something that doesn't give us immediate blessing and relief in this life too because it's for this life too. Jesus wants us, he wants you to sit at his feet and listen to his words, be hosted by him, be served by him in his word and sacrament where he chooses not just, to, not just to go to the cross for you thousands of years ago to take your sins away, but to continually come to you every other Sunday here at church and offer you his own body and blood, the same body and blood that were on that cross at Calvary to strengthen your faith and seal his forgiveness on you, make you certain that you are forgiven. Jesus wants you to have that, not just because it's the only way to heaven, but because it's crucial for your life in a world full of evil. He wants you to hear what he has to say and receive his service so that you're prepared for whatever is to come, whatever that might be. The author of the, the hymn of the day that we just sang, Johann Schrader, he's a good example. 
Uh, if you're like me, you might get distracted during him and, and zone out during one of the verses and start looking at those little tiny words at the bottom of the page that tell you who wrote the hymn and when and where it came from. It's an interesting story. If you look, you see he was born in 1667. He became a Lutheran pastor at the age of 29, and, uh, and, and kind of like your pastor, he got married the same year, or in, uh, about a year from then. Uh, la- less than a year later, he became a widower when his young wife di- died in childbirth. And then two years later, at age 32, he went to heaven himself. Not exactly a life, uh, a life layout, a life projection that you would expect. But throughout all that turmoil, he knew the one thing needful, and he knew it so well that he could write a beautiful poem of of comfort that people will sing for, that have been singing for hundreds of years since. He knew the one thing needful, his Savior's love. He knew his Savior's service to him. He knew what to focus on in life. Martha, in our story, is an example of this as well. That one thing needful. Sure, she's kind of the bad example at first because she's distracted by all these other good things, but but God in his word doesn't, doesn't say any of the stuff she was doing was bad. She was just distracted by it. All the evidence that we have points to this happening before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So why do you think he needed her to sit at his feet and hear what he had to say? Why do you think he wanted to go to her house, stay there, and, and, and talk to her to explain his love and his power and his will to her? Was it really just because he wanted to go there because he knew she was a gracious host and would do everything she could to make him happy and comfortable? I mean, what's, what's more important for her, Martha, and Mary to be the perfect hosts and serve Jesus perfectly, make him as comfortable and happy and well-fed as possible, or for her to be prepared to face her brother's death? I mean, the answer is obvious, right? One is far more important than the other. Her focus needed to shift. She needed to stop being distracted by all the good things she could do to serve and see her Savior's service for her. And, and frustratingly, Luke doesn't record her answer. The story just kind of ends there with Jesus refocusing her, so we don't know what she says to Jesus. and We don't know how she responds to Jesus' gentle redirection, but what we do know is that Later, when her brother dies, she gives one of the most beautiful and powerful confessions of faith recorded in all of Scripture. Her brother's dead. He's been dead for days, and Jesus shows up too late, which was his plan. And Jesus goes to Martha, and he says, your brother will rise. Without missing a beat, Martha says, I know he's going to rise. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Amazing, already, her trust in her Savior her confidence. And and then Jesus responds with the famous and familiar words, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Again, without skipping a beat, yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. How in the face of terrible loss could she confess her faith so beautifully and confidently? She was focused on the one thing needful. She knew what her Savior had done for her and for Lazarus and for all the other believers. So friends, when when you're feeling like Martha and, and you're worried about many things and you're upset and you're frustrated and distracted by all the things you have to do, all those good things we and good opportunities that God puts in our life for serving God, and let's face it, It's like every day, isn't it? (laughs) We're worried and distracted and upset about all these different things. When you see those signs, hear your Savior's voice gently and compassionately calling, Martha, Martha, you're so worried about so many things. Those are good things, but that's not what I want for you. Come sit at my feet. Let me serve you. Let me give you words of comfort that can never be taken away, no matter how your service in this life might change. Think of what I've done for you focus on that. Then and only then can you begin to serve God and others freely without guilt, without worry, and to God's glory. This has to be the focus of our Christian lives. You know, I did find my my screwdriver that was missing that Saturday. Here's what it took. About an hour and a half of cleaning my barn. That was long overdue. But there it was, (laughs) under some trash, where it should be, I guess. Um, I just needed to get my life in order, and then there was the one thing needful. 
But that's not how this works with God. This story is not God saying, you guys are so distracted by all the good things and, and, and thank you for thinking of all these good ways you want to serve me, but you're so distracted you guys just need to shape up, figure it out, and, and come back to me. That's not how our God works, is it? He's not asking for you to fix it. He's not asking for you to come back. He's just saying, here's what I've done for you. Just receive it. Receive my love. Receive my service. Receive my forgiveness and my eternity and my reward. It's there for you. Focus your Christian life, friends. Focus it, center it, make it all about service, but not yours. That's second. That's good. But it's not the main focus. Focus your entire life on Jesus' service for you. And you'll never go wrong. Amen. Please stand. We'll continue by confessing our Christian faith in our Savior, Savior who serves us using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him and all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We continue our worship this morning by joining together in the responsive prayer of the church. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single, and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. (coughs) 
Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. We continue our worship with the next hymn, hymn 633, Speak, O Lord. Please stand. We continue our worship with a celebration of the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Lord God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the, etern the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our, prayer, er, hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Given in death for you.
this week. Next Sunday is going to be our special outdoor service, our, our, our kind of church picnic Sunday and, and summer adventure camp um, Sunday. That means if you're here at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, you will be, you'll be kind of a lonely crew. You'll be by yourself. The air conditioning will be nice, but other than that, you'll, you'll be looking forward to some fellowship maybe a little later. There's only going to be the one service next Sunday at 1030, and it's going to be over at school, God willing, weather permitting, another thing to pray for. It'll be on the school lawn, so bring a lawn chair and uh, be ready to, to worship together with your fellow believers and to enjoy some food and fellowship afterwards. We have a food truck lined up. They're going to provide um, uh, grilled cheese sandwiches with different toppings for us. So even if you're going to uh, go to church on Thursday night so you can worship in the building, uh, you have the opportunity then to just come at the end of the service and enjoy fellowship and food as well. I won't judge you for that. So, uh, so we, just a reminder, this week is Summer Adventure Camp. Pray for that. And then next week is our outdoor service. So there's no 8 o'clock service here at church. There will be a 1030 service at school. Um, the regular Thursday service will happen this week. Also, this week is our regular uh, meeting night on Tuesday. Board for Christian Education, Church Properties, Church Council will meet. And then a week from Tuesday is our next uh, quarterly voters meeting. So that'll be tu uh, Tuesday the 26th here at church at 7 o'clock. Again, with all our voters meetings, everyone is invited to attend and encouraged to attend. That way you know how the church is running. You get to hear all the reports from the different committees and pastors and principal, all of that. And you're able to share your input with, with those who are voting members. This voters meeting is particularly important because it will begin with a call meeting. We'll be calling, um, extending our next call to see if we can get our next pastor uh, to come here to Salem. And then one other final thing you'll notice, there's a, a, a little note in the bulletin. Our love offerings this year ha have been designated to go to our, our brothers and sisters in faith in Ukraine, the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, a church body we're in fellowship with. So if you use your love offering envelope, or I think we have the, the door offering at Thanksgiving, that's what that goes to. So that, that has been designated to go to um, the Ukrainian Lutheran Church. Um, I believe that's all I've got for you today. So God bless you with uh, safety and health as you serve him and his kingdom and receive his wonderful service on your behalf this week. And God bring us back together again, uh, not here next week, but, but at school next Sunday. We'll close our worship today by singing our final hymn, hymn 925, on what now has been sown. Thank you.